And that's what we're going to be looking at tonight. If you would, please stand with me in the honor and reverence of reading of God's Word. And turn with me, if you would, to the Old Testament, to the Psalms, in Psalm 8. Psalm 8. And we're going to be reading the whole psalm, but we're going to be bouncing off and kind of springboarding off of one verse out of Psalm 8. If you're with me in Psalm 8 tonight, would you say amen with me? Amen. <laughs> psalm 8, the Word of God tells us is, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent thy name is, or thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man? that thou visitest him. For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou hast madest, madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beast of the field, the fowl of the air, and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passes through the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. And I want you to go with me and go look in, in this psalm, looking like honing in on verse 4. It says, What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? I'm going to preach you the message titled tonight is, What is man? What is man? And we're going to be looking in and studying that tonight. So let's go to God in a word of prayer and ask him to help us in this service tonight. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be able to to read your word. We're not looking for it, Lord, but we're, we're looking in it, hearing what you would have to say to us, Lord. Lord, I pray that you just have your way in the service tonight, Lord. Fill me with the Holy Spirit, God, and help me to preach your word as it's spoken to me, God. I pray that it, you use it, Lord, to be able to speak to others. Lord, as we look at this, and this question, Lord, as we raise, is what is man that thou art mindful of him, Lord? I pray, Lord, that we that we have these thoughts in our, in our hearts, Lord, and we look to you and what you've done for us. We love you and thank you in all this, and we pray in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Y'all may be seated. Thank you for standing. So a little bit of background in Psalm 8. Psalm 8 is one of the Messianic, uh, one of the messianic psalms written by, written by David. Not really sure when it was written or how it was written. It was... Um, kind of a couple of skeptics, or some people say how it, well, where it was written. Is some people say it was written whenever he was over the mountains of Gath. But regardless, this is the messianic in nature. As we see in verse four, is what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? In verse five, for thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. We see this verse is quoted in the New Testament as well. We'll look at that here in a little bit. And I want to take some time to think on this thought as David had thought in this psalm right here is, what is man that thou art mindful of him? So, and when studying this out, if you actually look at this phrase, and you, uh, you go and look at this phrase, what is man, it's actually found six times throughout the word of God. And it's funny if you study numerology when you think about it, because the number six is also the number of man. And it's right before number seven, which is the number of completion. So we'll go and look at it. It's just a couple of references. So we're going to we're keep your finger here in Psalm 8. But we're going to go and look at a couple of these references tonight. We're not going to get too far into detail in these references. But I just want to show you where these questions come up in the Word of God. So turn with me also to the book of Job. The book of Job, chapter 7. One book back from Psalm, Job chapter 7. Job chapter 7, looking in verse 17. The Bible tells us, it says, What is man that thou shouldest magnify him, and that, shall, and that thou shouldest set thine heart upon him? So we see in this instance where we see the phrase, we see this phrase as well as what is man. We see that Job is giving the appeal to, or this answer to Eliphaz, and and Job is not in a good place as we as we read through the book of Job in this in this part right now. He's he's not in a good place and not with good friends if we read through it. Instead of the word mindful though, 
like what, what David used. Job uses the word magnify, giving the idea of zooming in or enlarging or to see something completely. Uh, we get the idea that he is magnified, not putting, putting upon or setting above anybody else, but zoning in. Like if you ever, as a kid, I don't know if you ever did this in a, in a science class in school or whatnot, but if you ever took a, and this is kind of bad, but if you ever took a magnifying glass to an ant hill and just look at all the little ants in the ant hill, it's, you know, those little ants are tiny, but when you look through that magnifying glass, those ants seem pretty big. So, but we see the same phrase here re uh, referenced in Job 7. We go with me in Job 15 as well. So turn over a couple of pages and we'll see in Job 15... Like I said, we're not going to get too much into the context, or the context of these verses. I just want to show you where these verses occur in the Word of God. So in Job 15, 14, Job 15, 14, the Bible tells us, What is man that he should be clean? And he which is born of a woman that he should be righteous. You see, this phrase is used in this speech from a life as. This is the second speech that he has uh, talking to Job. And throughout the circumstances he was in, and Eliphaz is questioning Job, and to see the verse that he points out that we are all flesh and all unrighteous. Is what he says is, and he it says, what is man that he should be clean, and he is born of a woman that he should be righteous. Go with me here, and as we go back to Psalm, keep your finger still in Psalm 8, but we're going to go to Psalm 144. Psalm 144. I'll have, a, I'll have a, few, a few more verses to go along with these. But in Psalm 144, looking at verse 3, it says, Lord, what is man that thou takest knowledge of him? Or the son of man that thou makest account of him? This is another psalm of David in giving praise to God and the victories in life and the battle in declaring the glory of God. We read throughout the, uh, the rest of the psalm. And also go with me to Ecclesiastes. So go with me to Ecclesiastes. Chapter 6. Ecclesiastes chapter 6. <clears throat> Ecclesiastes chapter 6 verse 11. This is from King Solomon in his later years. The Bible tells us chapter 6 verse 11 Seeing there be many things that increase vanity, what is man the better? And we see this is the great vanity of vanities books. You know, we see here that Solomon is writing and showing us that, you know, as showing us as man increases in vanity. We see the problems in the heart of mankind as we we're never satisfied and everything under the sun or in this world is empty, is vanity. And also we're going to go and look. In Hebrews, go to the New Testament, to the book of Hebrews with me. Hebrews chapter 2. And this is where more commonly what people would know where this is from because this is the exact quote that the, the author of Hebrews is, is writing in this. So he's making the direct reference, direct quote. But Hebrews chapter 2, verse 6 Hebrews chapter 2, verse 6, it says, But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels, thou crownest him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of thy hands. You see, the writer of Hebrews is quoting this famous psalm, or this messianic psalm from David, and we see further on as we finish quoting, let's go ahead and finish out reading, but we'll see the humanity of Jesus. This is what he's talking about in verse 7. We stopped at verse 7. Let's go ahead and look at verse 8 in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 8. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet, for in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not, uh, we see not yet all things put under him. But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, may be, that, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. For it became him for whom, all, for whom are all things and by whom are all things 
in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. So we see this, we see this of the humanity of Jesus. This, this passage is talking about the humanity of Jesus as we're, as Jesus was, was God in flesh and made a little lower than the angels as man is. Um, but Jesus was the God man and tasted death for every man. So going back to, to Psalm, we'll go back to Psalm 8 and we'll look at this. It says, we'll, we'll raise the question. <clears throat> we see the question is raised these six times throughout the word of God. What is man? that thou art mindful of him. And we still, need to, we still need to scratch the surface of what is man. To do this, we must see our condition before God. We see man's state before God. One of the questions that, that can be raised out of this is, why did God create us? Well, let's go to Revelation chapter 4, and we'll see. The simple, one of the... The simpler explanations, but it's it's a lot more compl- it's I say it's a lot more a lot more complex maybe than that, but it's I would say it's more simple than what we give it credit for. A Revelations chapter four <clears throat> in verse eleven says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, meaning everything, all of us, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. So why did God create us? Simple. God created us for His pleasure. But what did God create us for? We were created to follow God. Go to, back to Ecclesiastes chapter 12 with me. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. we we'll be looking at verse 13 at the end of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes 12, 13 says, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Talking about this is, this is the conclusion of this whole book that Solomon is writing. This whole book of van- vanity of vanities. What is it? Let us hear the whole conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. We were created to follow God. We were also created to have fellowship with God and to love and to love God and to worship God. Go with me to 1 John. It'll be all the way in 1 John. <clears throat> 1 John chapter 1, beginning in verse 3. 1 John chapter 1, verse 3 says, That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us. This is John speaking to John speaking to them is well, you may have fellowship with us, talking about the believers, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So we are created to have fellowship. We are created to worship. We are created to know God. Go with me and turn a few pages over to John chapter four. Beginning in verse, verse 7, John chapter 4, verse 7 says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and every one that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not, uh, he that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. So we're created, we're, we were created to know God. We were created to love. And that's what we were, we were created to glorify, worship, reverence, and honor in the word of God. We're created to do all these things, but in ourselves we are depraved in our good works. Now, when I say the word depraved or depravity, a lot of the uh, Calvinistic people will say, oh, yep, that's it. Well, no, that's the definition of depravity. Just Depravity does not mean that lost man is lost man or natural man is not incapable of love, noble acts, good deeds, unselfishness, compassion, decency, morality or self-sacrifice and the list can go on that doesn't mean that natural man or or lost man can't do these things depravity just simply means that all these deeds all these good deeds are corrupted by man's inner nature and earn no favor with God this means that as we read in Job, as we read in Job 15 that that what is man that he should be righteous for our righteousness is filthy rags as it says in Isaiah Although God created us for his pleasure, sin has corrupted that relationship. And as lost sinners, we cannot be in fellowship with God 
and, the ple- and, and in the pleasure that he created us for. We'll go, go to, with me to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, and if you know where I'm going with this, then you'll know, you'll know the Romans road. I pray that we, have it all, that we have it all memorized, but it's always good to go turn with it and turn to it in your Bible to know where everything, where everything is. So we're going to simply read Romans chapter 3, starting in verse 10, 10 and the following. It says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that, that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. There are, they are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. By the way, that's what we were without God. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it is saith unto them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So this paints the perfect picture of man's state before before God. Paints the perfect picture of man's sinful state. In the Old Testament law, we can never live that we can never live up to in God's holy standard. If you read your Bibles, you'll see quickly, quickly, that the law and the children of Israel, even with the law, the children of Israel still disobeyed. And how often do how often do we do we disobey? How often it's easy to look at back throughout the the Word of God, and you know, uh, thinking about this is you know the uh, the first sin, and you know Adam and Eve. And how we, we can have that, that notion of, oh, they just had one job and one commandment. But there was, there was more to it than that. There, there was more to it than that. And we see that even with that, sin still creeps in. And even if, you know, God's withholding, we, we think that sin is, or what we're doing is we're, God's withholding something from us. But he's, also, he's actually just trying to protect us. And what God, this is what God's all said that we can have. This is what God has said that we, can, that we can do, that we can enjoy in His good pleasure, and we can glorify Him in doing these things. But God tells us, yeah, we can, you, can, you can do these things, but we always want the one thing that we can't have. Isn't that, isn't that just the sinful nature of man? That's man's state of what we have. And we see at man's state, we see a holy God, there has to be, a whole, the whole, a holy punishment. There's man's punishment for this. As we see the condition of man's heart in this, and the state that man is in, we see that we as sinful man have violated God's perfect law, even in even in our good works. I mean, well, what is man to do in this situation? Well, if you've broken a law, there must be repercussions. There must be a penalty. There must be a payment for the violation of the law. Go with me to James 4.10 real quick. And we'll show you. James 4.10. James 4.10 states is, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Well, dang, I I missed my verse. I miss my verse. But, oh, here it is. Hang on. I miss my verse. I'm sorry. I apologize. But we see that it's here in James we're talking about where he is, where he is talking about the, uh, the law, where we, have, uh, where we have the law. And if we have, it tells us to keep the whole law, but if you break one point, you're, uh, break one point, you're guilty. In Romans 6.23, we'll go back to there. Go back to Romans 6.23. Romans 6.23, verse part, first part of that verse says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
we see the rest of we see that in Romans 6 23 it says the wages of what we earn is the sin death is death this is the state of man that we find ourselves in dead in our trespasses and sin against the holy God and then we have from that is man's savior well we see that you know, we, we are dead in our trespasses. All this, that we are depraved in any of our good works. We're depraved of, you know, of our, in our inner nature of, of being able to have this relationship with God. Well, we see in the rest of Romans 6.23 that the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. A gift is something that you don't, that you don't earn. This is something we don't, we don't ever have to earn it. And look with me in Romans 5.8. In Romans 5.8 it says, But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And Romans 5.8 tells us that God showed his love and, and this pleasure of us as his creation, in that while we were still sinners, that we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for all to restore this relationship back to himself and God the Father. And go with me to 2 Corinthians Second Corinthians five, looking at verse twenty-one. You see, for he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And Second Corinthians five twenty-one shows us that we are made righteous, that we are made in the righteousness of Christ as we accept this free gift of salvation. God looks upon God looks upon us as we have Christ's righteousness imputed onto us, if we were to accept this free gift. And going back to Romans, Romans 3, going back to Romans 3, beginning in verse 24, it says, Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. And just honing in on this word propitiation, just to go with me to 1 John, go back to 1 John chapter, chapter 2. First John chapter 2, verse 2. The Bible tells us, And He is the propitiation for our sins, and not, all, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And then go one more page, a couple more pages over to 1 John 4.10. And 1 John 4.10 says, Herein is love, not that we love God, but He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. And these three verses, honing in on this propitiation, shows us that Christ was the full satisfaction for this sin debt we owe. If we did not have Christ... On the cross, everyone would have to pay for their own sin debt, which is physical death, and from the sin of the curse, but also spiritual death or full, like, full separation from God the Father for all eternity in a place called hell. So what is, what is man and what could be done? Well, John 3.16, if you want to go there, familiar passage, familiar verse. John 3.16 tells us what can be done. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. We see this as a starting point in what is man to God. If we simply believe on Jesus Christ as our full satisfaction, as our Savior, we shall be saved. Ephesians 2.8, Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9 says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It tells us that we are to be saved by, we are saved by the grace of God through faith in His Son, Jesus Christ. It's not of works, but in all the finished work of the cross and the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
So we see this is where this is where the, the rubber meets the road. That's where that's where we start. Well, how do we how do we get to this point? Well, Romans chapter ten. Romans chapter ten. In verse nine, looking at verse nine says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. This tells us that to openly confess and believe in our hearts, and the Lord Jesus Christ died and was buried and rose again from the grave and was victorious over death and the grave and did so for you, that you shall be saved. And 10.13 shows us how to do that as well. Looking within verse 13, it says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That gives us the invitation not just, to, not just to me, but to all. Just as Jesus bore all the sin depth of the world on the cross, he did so for you. What is man that thou art mindful of him? We were created for God's pleasure. Not that he was lonely or in need of praise or worship or companionship because he's all sufficient. God didn't need all those things. But we were created in his pleasure and he takes, ple he takes pleasure with us as we follow and worship him. We are simply God's creation in which he takes pleasure and just looks in the pleasure from the very beginning of creation saying it was good. All out of God's love for us is he mindful of us. And we should bring honor and praise and worship to him. And let's pray and we'll open up for invitation tonight. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you. As we look at this phrase, God, of what is man that thou art mindful of him? Lord, as we see these, as we see this thing, as we see these things, God, and just, just know that, that you did all this for us. Lord, we don't fully understand it, but Lord, we trust you. We place our faith in you, God. We thank you for everything that you've done for us. Lord, speak to our hearts tonight and guide this invitation. And we love you and thank you. And it's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We open up a time for invitation. Maybe the, the Lord has spoken to you about something tonight. I know, he spoke, I know he spoke to me doing this message. and not hope you didn't just come to, to hear me preach or expect anything from me, but well, I hope you heard to come to hear from the Lord. I pray that, that, he's doing, that he's done something for you tonight. What is man that thou art mindful of him? You know, we can go, we can go with that question. And go thinking about this this topic, but we can just some, simply just be like David and just ask the question. We can be like Job and just ask the question: What is man that thou art mindful of him? <laughs> we can ask that of ourselves. God, what what am I that you are mindful of me? Why would you why would you take why would you take care of me? Why would you provide for me? But he does. He loves us. He loves you. And just put our faith and trust in him and know that he is mindful of us. Maybe you maybe you're here tonight and you don't you don't know. Jesus Christ as your Savior. You may be wondering, is God mindful of me? Well, come and get it assured tonight. Come down to an old altar. And get that settled tonight. I pray that we think on these things. We open up our hearts to what God would have us to do what God is mindful of in our lives.
Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for everything that you've done for us. So we ask this question tonight, Lord, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Lord, I pray that we're, we're walking, Lord, in worship and reverence and, and fear of you and being mindful of you, God and what you would have us to do. Being mindful, Lord, and walking in, in the fruit of the Spirit. Lord, that we can share to others, Lord. Lord, just thank you for the message tonight. Thank you for the hearts tonight, God. See us out safely tonight, Lord. Help us to have a, a, good, a, a good weekend, Lord, Memorial Day weekend. Help us to be safe, Lord. Bring us back here Wednesday night, Lord. So we hear from you. Prepare our hearts, God. Help us this, go on this week to be mindful of you. And we give you all the honor, glory, and praise. And in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Till we meet again, take time to know the Lord and make him known. May the peace and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. God bless.